I had always had an interest in sex. Um, always had an interest in talking about sex. I had been told by psychologist friends, by non-psychologist friends, uh, you should really think about doing that. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And had some kind of uh, anxiety about committing to do that. Um, and then I just decided, fuck it, I'm going to do it. And um, I started uh, looking into what the requirements were to get ASEC certified, um, to be a, a certified sex therapist and started attending the, the ASECT um, uh, sex therapy conference uh, that they have annually. And that's where I saw Dr. Marty Klein, who's a huge name in, in sex therapy. Uh, and then I just sent him an email afterwards and I said, hey, uh, I like the way you think, um, will you be my supervisor? And so we had a little phone chat and he said, yes. And so I'm just learning so much from him, love it. And awesome. I, I it's it's insane the the amount of help that this guy can provide, and it, you know he's a unique mm -hmm. character. I very much appreciate him. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so anyways, I, I I'm going in like twenty different directions, but that's kind of how we landed here. Um, and yeah, so I'm pursuing. Uh, actual certification. I haven't yet decided if I'm going to or not. There's kind of pros and cons to being certified versus not. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to have a certification to call yourself a sex therapist in California. It's not like a psychologist uh, where that's mm -hmm. kind of a, a legal protected term. Um, but you do want to be very careful about, you know, when you advertise with that kind of stuff, because if you do not have the competency, that's something that um, puts you at legal risk. Um, so, yeah. Um, so anyway, that's why I'm getting the, uh, the the supervision, the training, and then doing a whole bunch of continuing education stuff on it. So, I, I love that. I'm a big proponent. Um, well, to to all the students, like just continuing to find supervision. Um, yes. and what I, they just heard is like really like just following what felt like intuitively right for you and like a good match for you personality wise and clinically. Um, and that's sounds like that's been a good endeavor for you. <laughs> so I like that. Yeah, yeah, it, it helps to inform my own approach to to sex and to sexuality. It and 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 that has informed my clinical practice. And I mean, it's just kind of this this feedback loop. Um, and um, yeah, it's really cool. I do. I I would say yes. Get some kind of mentoring group or supervision group or whatever the heck group um, where you have other clinicians. And, and so you know, if you're in private practice, you're not isolated and alone um, because growth becomes really challenging at that point. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, like you're saying, like the burden, like that clinical load too. Like without other people, it's like that's a lot for a, a person to, to hold. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, very cool. Well, kind of, that's a great segue into my first question is like, tell me a little bit about like who you typically see like in your practice and like what people are, are coming to you with. Yeah, excuse me. Um, I know that's very broad. So, you know, whatever feels you know relevant for you. I will tr I'll try to like <laughs> hone this in a little bit. Um, so I work with adults. We'll start there. Um, so 18, <laughs> 18, plus but but really most of my patients are kind of mid 20s to mid 40s um and um only individually i don't work with uh with couples and that's that's a decision i made for a couple different reasons but um maybe something i i, I choose to change in the future um but uh so right now just individuals um and uh, you know, kind of what they, they call me about for the most part, a, you know, are going to be things like, um, uh, performance anxieties. So they're having difficulty, uh, getting or maintaining an erection, um, having an orgasm within the time frame that they think that they should, um, and, or, or, or at all, um, uh, desire discrepancies within partnerships where one person mm -hmm. wants sex more often than uh, the other person, um, uh, relationship conflicts, difficulty, um, kind of uh, effectively communicating needs and wants and desires and fantasies, wishes, um, 
and 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 difficult emotions with their partner and, and processing that. Um, and people who think that they have um, a or who, who have been told uh, that they have a sex addiction uh, or a porn addiction. A lot of people who use porn instead of uh, seeking out sex with their partner. Um, you know, people who are interested in in exploring kinks and BDSM and um, and alternative relationship structures. Um, so whether that's kind of purely heterosexual swinging to whatever extent, or or polyamory, or um, uh, non-monogamy of of various iterations, uh, or kind of anything in between, um, helping them to navigate those those discussions, uh, as well as the, the thoughts and the feelings that come up um, uh, in those dynamics. Um, and, and I guess really just um, helping people to, to understand the narratives that they bring into their lives that relate to sex, that relate to sexuality, that relate to partnerships, that they mm -hmm. assume that their partner might have about, uh, about them. Um, and helping them to take a look at what those narratives are and to see, okay, does that, are those things actually in fact true? Uh, is there a different way to see it? Um, and, and then helping them to, to kind of be more aligned with their values if they're doing things that are not uh, aligned with them currently. So because of my training in, in substance use too, that's something that a lot of people do a lot of mixing with sex and drugs. Uh, or alcohol, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you know anything, cannabis. Um, and there can be huge, very pleasurable benefits to that. And we need to make sure that we're doing it safely, uh, that we're doing it consciously. Um, and, um, and so, um, yeah, so I help people kind of navigate how to do that in a safe way. Um, and, uh, so they need to know their dosing. They need to know how their body reacts to certain things. They need to, you know, trust the person that they're going to be with. They need to have kind of safety and backup plans if they're going to be using any kind of um, uh, the substance that's illegal. So cocaine or ecstasy or MDMA or, uh, you know, some kind of a pill. Um, I have them test their substances before they, before they use them. Um, fentanyl mm -hmm. strips are easy to get in the lock zone. You can get over the counter at a pharmacy. Um, you get good RX, the, uh, the little, uh, prescription app. And for like 20 bucks or something, um, you get two doses of naloxone that could save somebody's life, uh, or yours. So, um, you know, yeah. So helping people to yeah. do that in, in, in a safe and, and conscious way. And then one thing that we were talking about just before we started recording, I think that, that I do want to mention is that the people that I work with, um, I, I, I focus on those who in, are engaging in consensual sexual behaviors. Um, so where they're consenting to what's going on, the other person or other people are consenting to what's going on. And, and so not working with people who are um, you know, uh, filming somebody without their knowledge, not working with people who are um, engaging in sexual behaviors with people who cannot consent, uh, including children. Um, you know, there is this dialogue around, um, you know, certain uh, mental uh, disabilities and can they consent and how do we get that kind of consent and that's kind of beyond my ability to, to answer but um, uh, and, and certainly uh, uh, zoophilia um, sex with animals can't get human consent there so not something that I work with although I am taking the CE course I think next month on that so I do want to understand uh, it a little bit better but um, yeah yeah long-winded answer that's just what you're going to get no today. it's it's great great and I you know I wrote down like well, just as you're talking to different things that I want to touch on it, and there's a lot there. Um, I guess one thing, just going back to like where you, the very beginning, what you started with like people coming in, you said like people have been told that they have a sex addiction or a porn addiction. I guess as, like, as a clinician or just like working with people, like what is, how do you move like kind of the language of the narrative from viewing something as like that, a sexual addiction 
to understanding it like a non-pathologizing way, a way that feels like more workable. Yeah. And, and that's, that's broad, but <laughs> again, what you know, yeah, I, I, I like the question. Um, and, and it depends. Um, but, but usually on, I, I have, um, an initial phone call that I'll have with, with, uh, prospective patients just to make sure that we're good enough fit and I can do kind of my own screening in terms of personality and the way that they think about things and talk about things to make sure also that they're engaging in consensual behaviors um, to make sure that you know if they do have depression that we don't have suicidal thinking in the mix because that's something that I'm just not willing to take on right now um, and um, so so in in that, um, consultation. Some people will say, you know, I, I have a sex addiction. I'm a porn addict. I'm, you know, whatever that is. So I will tell them in that first session, you know, I, I obviously don't know you, but, um, you know, I, I may not agree with you once I learn more uh, that you in fact have a sex or porn addiction. And, you know, if that's something that's important to you, that your therapist aligns with the on, I may not be the right person for you. Um, and so, and the reason why I, I, I don't necessarily believe in the vast majority of people, certainly those that I work with, uh, that, that there's a sex or porn addiction is that is because I think we have false narratives around what is okay for sex. You know, we have this very limited scope of this kind of sex is okay and this kind of sex is not okay. And if anything deviates from these little boundaries, then you have a problem. Or if your partner doesn't like what you're doing, right? Your partner uh, feels insecure uh, that you're looking at porn um, or is frustrated with the fact that you would prefer to look at porn rather than having sex with them. Um, we get labeled as a sex addict or a porn addict. And mm -hmm. the porn, the sex, that's a problem, but it's a symptom of, an, of a bigger problem. Um, and so that's really what I focus on is not just changing the behavior itself. Okay, don't look at porn, porn's bad because I don't believe that at all. I think porn can be lovely and enhances many people's sex lives, but, um, um, but to really understand why we're using porn, why we're using sex, right? Why are we pursuing these things? Is it because I have difficulty controlling impulses and urges? Uh, is it because I don't, um, I don't want to sit with these difficult feelings that I have when I'm alone? And so this is, a, this is an escape for me. I can have some pleasure. Um, is it fueled by an underlying mental health disorder? Am I in a manic or hypomanic phase of a bipolar disorder? And I am physiologically uh, uh, less able to control my behaviors. And so then we treat those things. Is it kind of a silent, indirect fuck you to the, to the other partner in the relationship of I'm unhappy about something. I'm not gonna tell you really what it is but I'm gonna do something that I know you don't like. And so there we have a communication issue um, as opposed to a sex or porn issue. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's just so many, so many other kinds of examples I could go through, but- um, But you're speaking, uh, you're speaking my language, right? It's like finding the function of the behavior. I'm yes. Like, that's, the, that's the underbelly, right? That's where you do the work. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah, we, we have these, these terminologies for, for things. Oh, it, it's, it's this, it's that it's the other. Um, but okay. We don't treat the disorder. We're treating a human being and we need to understand what the function of the behavior is in order to treat it. Otherwise it's a game of whack-a-mole, you know? So everything that just, Oh, the symptom, symptom, symptom behavior. No. Ah. And then instead of just unplugging the machine, you know, or like, <laughs> re, like going in and like figuring out the gears and stuff. It's like, right. it's, it's just symptom management, which I think in our society is, it, we have a lot of, you know, oh yeah. shit, I, I, I'm feeling uncomfortable. Where's my pill? Um, so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, part of what you just said kind of answers some of my other questions around like, you know, 
what people are coming in for, what are some like the myths or the narratives that are coming in there. So like I have an addiction or here's like, like, you know, feeling shameful about a behavior. Um, and that was something that I was going to ask about too, is like the kind of role that you see shame has on people or like the hold it has, especially around sexuality and life, lifestyle um, practices and preferences. Yeah. Shame is huge um, in, especially uh, in, in sex therapy. I mean, it is in mental health in general, I think, but, um, um, but it, it, it's very big when we feel like we are a sexual outsider. Um, and, um, and, 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 and when we come in with these narratives that like, if I am male and um, uh, identify as a man and uh, I'm having sex with a uh, female identifying as a woman, um, that I need to um, not only get an erection, I need to uh, to maintain this erection. I need to fuck the right way. I need to be this dominant, you know, guy that we see uh, in, in, in the media and that we're told that we should be. And then I need to be able to uh, ejaculate and not only ejaculate an orgasm, but like a lot. Uh, you know, like that's the definition that, like, as as men, that we get told like that's manly and. <laughs> And, and so like what that does though, is that sex becomes a performance. It's, it's not, it, it takes away a lot of the fun. It takes away a lot of the curiosity, the playfulness, the humor, the, um, uh, the vulnerability. Um, mm -hmm. And it really limits the, um, uh, the, the pleasure that we can derive from it. Um, and, and similarly for, for, for women, you know, if they're concentrated on um, how do I look, how do I smell, how do I taste, uh, you know, am I lubricated enough? Uh, does he like this? Do, you know, mm -hmm. it, do I look flattering from this angle? And by the way, men think about that too. Um, and, and, and so then we're, we're, we're so not in the moment and we're not in our bodies. We're all up in our heads about all these expectations. So while we seek pleasure and closeness in our sex if we were to ask people what are you what are you looking for in sex you know pleasure and closeness essentially is kind of what we we want but what we focus on in sex oftentimes are, are these behaviors these these um, um these performance anxieties you know um and so if we say we want something uh from sex and yet when we're having sex, we're thinking about something completely different. Like, no wonder we're going to have unsatisfying sex. Mm -hmm. So I think helping people to recognize the thoughts that they're having and the feelings that they're having during sex, becoming aware of that can be very helpful. And then helping them to identify how those thoughts are actually getting in the way of them experiencing pleasure even more helpful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if we removed the, the importance of having an orgasm or getting an erection um, or, or, or getting wet or being turned on, if we just removed the, the expectation that that needs to happen in order for successful sex to, 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 to happen, or, you know, one of my favorites is, you know, we both have to come at the same time. Um, <laughs> Which, like, if if you can make that happen, good for you. That requires a lot of communication and talk and being in sync, and like, it can happen. But, um, but if that's the expectation every time, like, you're setting yourself up to feel stressed and frustrated and and angry. And those are not often emotions that a lot of people find to be very sexy, although they can be. Um, mm -hmm. And so it, <laughs> it's it's uh, like into it. <laughs> Well, I, I, if, if there's any plug that I'm going to make, uh, it's going to be for, for the erotic mind. This book is, it, it, this was kind of my segue into, into um, sex therapy and what really kind of ignited my passion around it. Um, so I would highly recommend it. It's a completely new take on, on sexuality. Um, so The Erotic Mind by Jack Morin. Uh, another one that I really love, um, just because I 
really respect him and think he's fucking brilliant. And he lays it out so, so well. Uh, Sexual Intelligence by Marty Klein is another one that I really like. So I just had them here and I'm deciding to plug them. So nice. I, I'll, I'll take it. Um, our students are doing bibliotherapy as their next um, activity. As I was going to look up to see if anyone has those books, but that's probably too many steps right now. <laughs> <laughs> but they're like, um, so nope. many other I mean there's just like I mean just there's a new one um one of our local therapists um or a, a combo local therapist uh two of them Jennifer and Julia women in kink um and there's poly secure there's just there's a lot of stuff out there Doug Braun Harvey uh who uh started the uh, OCSB out of control sexual behavior group um I love Doug Braun Harvey. I don't quite know yet what I think of the out of control uh, concept. Um, mm-hmm. But anyway, that's beside the point. So, yeah. <laughs> well, great plugs, and um, I hope I hope some of those. I think some of those books that you mentioned um, we're going to be hearing about. So that's that's awesome. That's a great al- alignment. Um, well, again, more questions, and I wish we could like this probably. <laughs> The first of many conversations that we can have. I um, love that. Yeah, this is but fun. One thought that I was just having is, um, you know, kind of going with that like shame and like narratives, like the myths that people hold. What do you think are some of like the common like misconceptions people have about people who engage in like kinks and BDSM or even just alternative um, sexual preferences in general? Yeah. So. It, it, number one, that they're sick or that there's something wrong with them, Um, that they need to feel ashamed about it and that they need to go to a therapist to fix it. Um, My job is not to fix their stuff. My job is to help them understand that there is no one normal and you're allowed to have your own preferences. Again, with consent, being at the forefront of all of this, um and 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 to to help them to accept themselves and to embrace their own sexuality and their own kinks to not be ashamed of it um you know like if i love the smell of somebody's armpit and i just want to fucking go in there and my partner's like all right hey have at it like (laughs) okay like who cares go for it you know sniff away (laughs) um if I, if I like to be tied up and, uh, and if I like to be left in a room for hours, knowing that I have a way to be able to communicate if I'm needing to get out of those restraints, um, you know, if I'm in a master slave relationship, uh, potentially, um, then, okay, like, if that brings you pleasure and joy and gratification, like, let's pursue that. That's something that I think we, we don't often talk about enough is, is pursuing pleasure, which Doug Braun Harvey, to his credit, does. Um, and, mm-hmm. and so I think that that's, it, it, it's huge. And so we focus on these like, oh, this is bad. This is shameful and I'm wrong and I need to fix it. But I really help people to deconstruct these myths that you know, uh, if you like something that's different from what you see on TV or what your friends are telling you that they do or that they like or uh, whatever, that um, that there's something wrong with you. Like, I, yeah, I just, I don't buy it. I don't believe it. Um, And, and again, I will preface all of that with the fact that the people that I work with do engage in consensual behaviors um, where they talk about these things before they engage in sexual acts, right? So uh, sex can be, uh, for those who who don't have experience talking about it, sex can be very um, uh, uncomfortable to talk about. And um, I just got like a text message that I'm like now distracted. Um, (laughs) Losing my train of thought. Ah. Oh man, Um, where was I? Is um is the text message regarding to having to take a break? No, no, no. I'll let something you know different what happens. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> another random text message that throws us off. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry guys. Um, it, but, shame, like, shame, shame. You no, know, it's interesting about just what happened. Um, is what I was thinking about is like the 
Um, you know, in DBT, we talk about mindfulness and being, you know, consciously aware of our behaviors and self-soothing and finding joy and finding, you know, accumulating positives. Um, and I think a lot of the feedback I get from people too is like, it can seem like really rudimentary. Like, oh, get them a massage, you know, like get, have nice food or take a walk. It's like, well, what about talking about like sex? Like here's like this, again, like we have a huge, this is such an opportunity for people to explore and to work with their own shame and like working like body acceptance. We talk about body positivity and sex, sex positives. Like, well, first we have to like be with ourselves, know that and work on like, how do we, can we be with that compassionately, right? Yes. And so, and that's one of the hardest things, right? Is, is to be able to observe ourselves without immediately jumping to judgment. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so uh, the book, The Erotic Mind, um, has uh, it, you know, the, the, it kind of an erotic uh, journal uh, that they, uh, the, the author kind of suggested people to do, um, where you just start exploring your own kind of uh, fantasies and, and thoughts and uh, and feelings and memories and experiences and um, and and then being curious about it, adopting a curious attitude as opposed to one that's of judgment. Um, and mm-hmm. so if we if we can do that, if we can be mindful, um, then we're able to drop from our heads during sex back into our bodies and be able to have pleasurable, playful, creative, fun, uh, rewarding, fulfilling sex that is fucking mind blowing. Um, whereas otherwise it, it, it can feel robotic and, and, um, um, and, and performance based. Um, and that, that tends to zap a lot of the things that make sex sexy and fun and alluring for a lot of people. Right. Yeah. Um, well, being mindful of your time and thank you again for taking this time. Um, I kind of think like two kind of follow up thoughts or, and again, like this is just going to be tip of the iceberg for the conversation. Um, yeah. but, uh, going back to that idea of like, you know, kind of shame. One of the questions I had was, like, you know, from your people that you work with, if you were to tell like young clinicians, like, um, I'm thinking about people being invalidated by cl- clinicians, like maybe they bring something up and like, I mean, I see that a lot with my highly sensitive population. They'll come to me saying like, they just, they share this experience and they got met with like pretty extreme invalidation from a provider. And I, I think it comes from the place of like a lot of training of focusing on finding the problem, right? Or like that whack-a-mole solution, whack-a-mole. We're like, oh, we gotta, what is that? Oh, was that, does that mean that's something I need to do? like squash right now or <laughs> like, oh, that's yes. awesome. we don't work on that. Don't talk about it anymore, which is just shaming, right? Yeah. Um, so I was curious, like, you know, if you had advice for like young clinicians working with people disclosing, um, you know, sexual preferences or their lifestyle practices, um, what would be like, you know, a couple of things that you might share with them for, to be mindful of while they're in, in that role? Well, I think, you know, number one, like you're human too. Um, and so you're allowed to have your own preferences. You're allowed to have your own biases. You're allowed to have your own values regarding sex, sexuality, behavior, all of that stuff. Um, I think it's important to be aware of what those biases are. Um, it's so important in, 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 I mean, in therapy in general, being a human in general, but, um, but really important when we're talking about populations who have been marginalized, who have been pathologized, who have been persecuted, um, and who are absolutely fucking terrified to talk to people about this stuff. So you may be the first person that they are brave enough to tell, I'm doing something that I think is sick and wrong and gross, and I want help with it. And so we need to accept this humble position of recognizing the courage that it takes for somebody to call us and tell us that um, and check your biases at the door. Your responsibility at that point is really taking care of them and doing no harm, even if you completely disagree with what they are doing. 